Our next speaker is a proud graduate of Yale College who received his MD from Cornell and his PhD from Rockefeller University in New York, followed by a residency in pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is now an associate professor in the departments of laboratory medicine and pathology. His research focuses on telomeres. Yes, I can pronounce that word. <laughs> the structures at the ends of our chromosomes that maintain the integrity of our genetic information. Using mouse models, his laboratory was the first to show that telomere binding proteins are required to prevent the onset of features of premature aging in stem cells. Please welcome Dr. Sandy Chang. The topic, the long and short of it, telomeres in aging and cancer. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to the Yale Pepper Center for this invitation to speak to this illustrative forum. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit from Mary's talk, and I'm gonna tell you about cellular aging. So the first aspect of cellular aging I wanna tell you about is an experiment done in the, fifth, uh, in the 60s by uh, Leonard Hayflick, and it was a very simply, um, conceptually simple experiment, but with a profound implication. So Leonard Hayflick took normal human skin cells from young uh, patients and just patches them in culture. So what he found was that these cells, instead of growing indefinitely like you found in normal cancer cells, these cells actually stop dividing at a very defined stage, around 60 or 70 population doublings. This was very strange because it's, at the time when cancer cells were used as a model, cancer cells are immortal. They divide it indefinitely. So there's something intrinsic about normal human fibroblasts that stop your cell division. And in fact, they became senescent. They adopt a very strange phenotype. Quite unlike their youthful counterparts, the cells are flat, they develop bilobe uh, nuclei, and they stop dividing, but they are still metabolically active. So these senescent cells are, uh, at the time, not understood as to why they form. So when, now we know that uh, it is because telomeres, the structures that capture the ends of all eukaryotic chromosomes, uh, and they're the ones, the telomere structures are the ones that dictate the, uh, the ability of cells to, uh, to divide. For example, telomere length is very predictive of the replicative history of a cell, and telomeres are actually repetitive DNA sequences that capture the ends of all our chromosomes. And because telomeres are intrinsic to all cells, they um, offer, their divisions offer a replicative history as to how many cycles a cell can divide. And you can think of telomeres as the caps that the pl little plastic caps at the ends of our shoelaces. So in a functional shoelace with the proper capping uh, function, you can thread the shoelaces into holes and these shoelaces are functional. And these are like the telomeres in youthful cells. If you lose the plastic caps at the ends of your shoelaces, your shoelaces become frayed, no longer functional, and these are like the telomeres of senescent cells. They're no longer functional, no longer exert a capping function, and they're called dysfunctional. So this illustrates why telomeres become dysfunctional. And the reason why is because telomeres are part of a linear chromosomes and these cannot be replicated by the DNA polymerase from machinery. So this is what's called the end replication problem. And because of the failure for DNA polymerase to fully replicate linear chromosomes, telomere lengths shorten and you can actually uh, run these out on a gel. And you can see that telomeres in mortal cells actually decline and they become very short in senescent cells. If you look at telomere length in human white blood cells, you can see that telomeres actually whittle down by about 70 base pairs per year of life. And you know, in a long course organism like humans, you can imagine that the amount of telomeres that we lose can be quite substantial, something like 5,000 to 8,000 base pairs in our lifespan. So what is, um, what is the mechanism to prevent telomeres from shortening in important cells such as our stem cells? So this is, uh, the enzyme telomerase, an enzyme I'm sure many of you have, he have heard of. The enzyme telomerase has been um, usurped. This is a, uh, a reverse transcriptase usurped by the eukaryotic um, organisms to add telomeres de novo to the ends of eukaryotic chromosomes. The telomerase adds TTHEG repetitive sequences to our chromosome ends, thereby circumventing the end replication problem. Uh, uh, and we, we now know that telomerase is expressed 
only in certain restricted cell types. For example, our stem cells and our germ cells have telomerase activity, but our somatic cells do not. And that's why our somatic cells telomere shorten and undergo replicative senescence. Unfortunately, the level of telomerase in our, uh, in our, uh, um, in our germ cells and our st uh, stem cells does not appear to be enough. So even though those cells have telomerase, their telomeres still continue to shorten over time. In contrast, cancer cells have robust levels of telomerase. They divide indefinitely and they're immortal. So I should mention that the discovery of telomeres and telomerase was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2009. And this work was pioneered by Dr. Liz Blackburn with colleagues Jack Schulstax and Carol Greider. And the reason why I put this slide here is because telomeres were actually discovered at Yale when Dr. Blackburn was a uh, postdoc in Joe Gall's lab uh, at the Yale Medical School. That's where um, they discovered this unique structure at the ends of the chromosomes of Tetraheimla. So this, is, this slide illustrates our telomere hypothesis of aging and cancer. And this hypothesis has received a lot of experimental confirmation from work done in my own lab and as well as those from others. So what we postulate is that telomeres shorten because of insufficient level of telomerase and dis dysfunctional telomeres ensue, and these are actually recognized as damaged DNA. So dysfunctional telomeres activate a very potent DNA damage response that's P53 dependent. So P53 is the guardian of the genome. It's, a DNA, it's a activated by DNA damage, and it's a checkpoint. So the activation of P53 actually elicits the onset of cellular senescence, and in some cells, apoptosis as well. So cells actually die when they encounter dysfunctional telomeres in the presence of intact P53. So this is actually a very potent anti-cancer uh, mechanism. Uh, we've evolved this mechanism to prevent uh, cells with dysfunctional telomeres from hanging around. So we try to get rid of them by either stopping their cell division or by killing them. Unfortunately, an unintended consequence of this anti-tumor mechanism is that stem cell populations, or in highly pro proliferative organs, diminish their function and giving rise to premature aging phenotypes. On the other hand, dysfunctional telomeres in the setting of a P53 mutation, which is commonly encountered in many human cancers, actually is a pro-cancer mechanism. Dysfunctional telomeres in the setting of P53 deficiency actually drives tumor genesis, and I want to talk a little bit about this today. So we know that cancer incidence increases with age, and in fact, aging is actually the most important um, cause of human cancer. So if you look at telomere length in human preoneoplastic lesions, for example, at the Dr. Carl Summon site two in breast cancer, telomeres are actually very short in preoneoplastic lesions. And this is illustrated by this diagram here. This is a Dr. Carl Summon site two of the breast. You can see that nuclei are um, illustrated in, in blue, and telomeres are these little pink dots. So in basal epithelial cells, which are the support cells of the breast duct, you can see plenty of telomeres at these, in these cells. In contrast, the neoplastic luminal epithelial cells have very sh short telomeres because of their increased replicative histories, and these are the cells that will give rise to breast cancer. So this slide shows that pre-neoplastic lesions have already very short telomeres. And very short telomeres actually engender chromosome instability. So chromosome end-to-end -end fusions are a common feature of cells with very, very short telomeres. You can see here chromosomes are painted blue with a stain called DAPI. Telomeres are these little red dots at the ends of chromosomes. And these yellow arrows point to chromosomes that have fused end-to-end. -end. You can see that the side of the fusion, there are no telomere signals. Telomeres are so short that they've already joined together, causing massive genome instability. We've actually engineered this uh, model in the laboratory in mice, and in which we delete telomerase and the checkpoint protein P53 together in mouse models. So what happens is that these mice get cancer readily, breast cancer, skin cancer, and invasive colon carcinomas. Interestingly, if you inherit short telomeres stochastically, you are also prone to develop cancer. So the cancer incidence of patients with the shortest telomeres is something like three-folds higher than patients with the longest telomeres. And also cancer mortality also increases. So the acquisition of short telomeres is not a good thing in terms of cancer biology. So this can be explained in this diagram here. 
We think that with increasing epithelial cell renewal with advancing age, telomeres shorten in the absence of telomerase. These telomeres become recombinogenic. They become sticky. They undergo end-to-end -end chromosome fusion, generating what's called dicentric chromosomes, chromosomes with two centromeres. And these structures are inherently unstable. They get pulled to opposite poles of the spindle apparatus and cell division, generate chromosome breaks, amplifications, deletions. And for example, amplifications of oncogenes or deletions of tumor suppressors could generate a genetic milieu that is permissive for cancer growth. So this is what happens in carcinoma in situ. The telomeres are very short, but there's genetic rearrangement that's already permissive for cancer development. What human cancers do in this stage is that they can reactivate the enzyme telomerase. So they normally do not express telomerase at this point, but when they reactivate it, they can now become invasive cancers that they metastasize to disincise to kill their host. In fact, 90% of all human cancers reactivate telomerase. The other 10% utilizes an alternative lengthening of telomeres, a recombination-based mechanism to maintain their telomere length. In any, uh, any way cancers do it, they have to maintain telomere length to become invasive. So what I've illustrated is that we have a telomere reserve that's usually um, enough for, to maintain health up to maybe around uh, 70 or so years of age. So the telomere theory of aging also will postulate that in case p uh, patient, uh, uh, individuals that inherit uh, mutations in telomere length uh, maintenance program, for example, in telomerase, will have inherently shorter telomeres, and these shorter telomeres should trigger the onset of disease at an earlier age. And now we have very reliable ways to measure telomere length in human populations. So these are five individuals that I've illustrated here, and these are telomere length, and they look like a little Gaussian distribution. And this red line shows the average telomere length in humans. So you can see that in this particular patient, patient number two, the telomeres are very short, and skews to the left. If you analyze patient number two in more detail, they actually have a lot of telomeres that are quite critically short, many of them under 8 kb or so, or so of length. And in fact, patient number two developed a telomere disease, we call them telomopathy now, called this, this keratosis congenita. This keratosis congenita is a human disease, it's a telomere disease. Patients have characteristic skin phenotypes. They have extremely short telomeres, telomeres less than um, the first percentile, and they also develop very early bone marrow failure, sometimes as early as 30 years of age, in some cases uh, as 12 or 13 year olds. Bone marrow failure is characteristic of this disease, as well as uh, a very high increase in cancer incidence, for example, the development of AML. And pulmonary fibrosis is another feature that we see in these patients. So short telomeres in this setting develop um, uh, these whole host of human syndromes that are not, uh, that can be actually be modeled in the laboratory mice. So we, in this diagram, I've shown you that if you delete a telomere binding protein called protection of telomere one or POT1, the telomeres become critically short and hematopoietic stem cells, uh, as illustrated by these boxes here, actually become lost over time. So here's POT1 knockout mice at two month of age, four month of age, and six month of age, you can see that the hematopoietic cells gradually diminish, and around six months of age, the stem cells are almost completely gone, and this is coupled with almost total bone marrow failure that we see, a good phenocopy of the disease that we see in humans. And in fact, we now know that there are many pathways that need to be maintained uh, in order to prevent the onset of this keratosis congenital, and these are all pathways involved in telomere length maintenance. I've told you about telomerase, both the telomerase RNA component and the protein component could be mutated to cause this keratosis congenital, as well as components that's involved in the maturation of this enzyme. Deletion of POT1, as I just showed you, uh, causes the disease in mouse, and mutations in this telomere binding protein, TIN2, causes this keratosis congenital in humans at a very young age. 12-year-olds get bone marrow failure. We recently demonstrated that if you perturb telomere length replication uh, factors, for example, a protein called CTC1, critically important in telomere replication, these mice also get bone marrow failure very early and uh, eliciting a phenotype re uh, reminiscent of this keratosis congenital. So I've told you that short telomeres are 
could be pretty bad um, in terms of uh, symptoms that it could cause. So is there any way that we could ameliorate these short telomeres and maybe perhaps increase telomere length? So one obvious way is to express telomerase. This is, uh, could be readily done in cells. If you have overexpressed telomerase, telomere length increase, and you bypass the Hayflick limit. So here are cells without telomerase. They senesce at a population doubling of 60, as I showed you earlier. But in the setting of telomerase overexpression, these cells are now immortal. And what's amazing is that even though these cells are immortal and replicating, they do not have any genomic instability. Suggesting that expression of telomerase may be a way in the future to uh, slow down the rate of telomere shortening. We, all, we already could do this in cells, and recent publication from the Depeno lab have shown that if you overexpress telomerase in the laboratory mouse, it can actually rescue many of the uh, uh, stem cell functions and increase lifespan uh, in this mouse model. So the hope is that in the future, we could prevent uh, the onset of, or the development of dysfunctional telomeres and the genomic stability induced by the, uh, dysfunctional telomeres through selective activation or transient activation of telomeres. And maybe we could even uh, use this to decrease uh, resistance to stress-induced cellular senescence. While these are the benefits of transient telomerase therapy, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that increased telomerase expression may not be, always be a good thing. Always have to worry about that if you increase the doubling rate of any cell, you increase the rate of DNA mutations, because most of the mutations happen during DNA replication. And if you increase proliferation of pre-malignant cells, for example, uh, pre-malignant cancer initiating cells, for example, uh, perhaps the increase in cancer incidence would be inevitable. So the challenge in the future is to somehow add telomerase to the good stem cells, for example, and not to trigger uh, onset of cancer. So in summary, I've told you that some of the inherited factors, like, for example, the acquisition of short telomeres or the mutations in telomere link maintenance pathways accelerate telomere shortening, generate dysfunctional telomeres that's accessed as DNA damage promoting agent. And depending on the status of P53, uh, telomere dysfunction can actually promote uh, the onset of premature aging through stem cell exhaustion, or uh, in, the, in the setting of P53 deficiency, generate cancer through increased genomic stability. We can now reliably diagnose short telomeres. So this is maybe one way we could quickly uh, apply this to the clinic in a more general setting to look at people uh, that come to the hospital to look at the telomere length. So perhaps people with very short telomeres, we could help them uh, by suggesting, for example, lifestyle changes. We know that environmental toxins like reactive oxygen species, carcinogen, and cigarette smoking also lead to progressive telomere length shortening. So, uh, so changes in lifestyle may be beneficial. So I just want to thank uh, members of the lab. I'm not going to list them all by name. They're illustrated here. And I want to thank my funding sources, particularly the National Institute of Aging and Dr. Hodes, uh, for his support of my research. Thank you very much.